It is good to be with you and it is good to be in God's grace. There's nowhere else uh, to find life than in the grace of God. You may know that uh, at the end of his life, Dr. King gave a very famous speech called the Mountaintop Speech. And he said, I have been to the mountaintop. And what he was saying, part of what he was saying there is that America is in the wilderness, racially speaking. America's in the wilderness. He was in the wilderness. And that's where we are uh, today. We're studying what it means to wander in the wilderness because it's an important theme in the Bible. If you can't understand the Bible without understanding this part of it, but it's also very relevant to our current uh, context. Remember, uh, the wilderness is the place in between. It's not where you once were. It's not where you will someday be. It's a place in between. It's an uncomfortable place, but it's a place that you have to pass through. It, it, we're learning from Moses that there are two ways you can travel. You can travel in such a way that at the end you've only aged in bitterness. Or you can travel in such a way that you grow in grace. And that's, that's what we all want. We all want to grow in grace. And so last week I, I shared with you a little practice. Did you try it? Uh, lifting up your heart and, and, and saying like in the morning and evening and then when you kind of feel the gloom, you be lifting up your heart to the Lord. Today what I'd like to do is explore just a little bit more, kind of double click on that practice and ask what does it really mean to lift up our hearts to the Lord? So to do that, we'll go again to Moses. We were last week at the end of the story. Now I'm going to go all the way back to the beginning of the story, to Exodus chapter 33, uh, verses 18 through 23. So if you brought a Bible or a phone or something, open up the text. It'll be helpful to you as we, as we uh, discuss this to be able to look at it. We're going to put the words on the screen. But I would invite you to read aloud with me this passage. And if you're able, let's go ahead and stand here or at home as a sign of reverence uh, to the one about whom this passage is written Jesus Christ, our Savior. And when we're done reading, I'll say this is the word of the Lord. Listen carefully. You're hearing God's holy word. Verse 18, Moses said, show me your glory, I pray. And the Lord said, I will make all my goodness pass before you and will proclaim before you the name, the Lord. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious. And I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. But he said, you cannot see my face, for no one shall see me and live. And the Lord continued, see, there is a place by me where you shall stand on the rock. And while my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft of the rock, and I will cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will take away my hand, and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. This is the word of the Lord. Heaven and earth will pass away, but what we just read never will. Please be seated. So what does it mean to lift up our hearts to the Lord? Well, I think Moses shows us here, just to give you the context. Remember, this is at the foot of Mount Sinai, just after the golden calf fiasco. Uh, he's here just as the Lord has been making covenant with Israel, Israel has been breaking covenant with the Lord, right? So right, this is part of our story. Right from the very beginning, these people like us are in a spiritual wilderness. And so what Moses does is he, he, he sets up a tent, a, a place where he can enter in and lift up his heart to the Lord. And there's this interaction. Moses says, show me your glory, Lord. And then the Lord says, I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious. This is a conversation that's happening. Moses is lifting his heart to the Lord. The Lord is answering Moses. There's a conversation that happens and we hear it. We hear Moses and what I call the cry of the soul. And we hear the Lord in what I call the shelter of grace. The cry of the soul and the shelter of grace. I believe that Jesus is inviting us to this same conversation. So let's try to understand these two statements. Let's begin with the cry of the soul in, in, the, in the first statement. Show me your glory, I pray. This is a cry for spiritual renewal. 
There's a negotiation that's happening here. And the question is, will Israel live, will Israel be allowed to live in God's presence or not? Now, uh, this is what the, uh, the Lord has just said to Moses at the beginning of the chapter. I want to make sure you don't miss this. This is chapter 33, verse 3. The Lord says to Moses, go up. Remember, this is right after the golden calf thing. Go up to a land flowing with milk and honey, but I will not go up among you, or I would consume you on the way, for you are a stiff-necked people. And you go, wait, wait, did you see that? Did you, did you hear what he just said there? The Lord said, if you want, you can get out of the wilderness without me. You, you can do it without me. You can have what you want, the promised land. You can have that, milk and honey and all that. You can have that without me. This is really stunning. This is the Lord offering Israel a secular state. You could be a secular nation if you want, right? It's like he's giving Israel this kind of spiritual off-ramp. Yeah, if you want, you can get off here. It's almost like he, he says, he advises them to do that, right? It's, it's like he's saying, let's do that. Let's just do that. Let's forget the whole tablet thing. Do whatever you want to your, with your idols and your neighbors. You can be like everybody else if you want. But Moses, Moses says no. He says, and this is verse 15, if your presence will not go, do not carry us up from here. One of my favorite verses in the Bible. Moses is asking for a spiritual reset. We want to go. We have to go. We must go in your presence, Lord. And he's crying out for spiritual renewal. Almost like he's saying, you know, if we must be consumed, let us be consumed with you. Show me your glory, Lord. That's his prayer. Now, I think sometimes we have to be in the wilderness before we're willing to pray a, a prayer like that or ready. Richard Lovelace, who was one of the great scholars of spiritual re renewal in the history of the church and one of my professors, by the way, in grad school back in the 16th century, <laughs> Richard Lovelace says there are two preconditions for spiritual renewal. And the first is awareness of the holiness of God. And the second is awareness of sin in ourselves. The awareness of the holiness of God is the, is the yearning for something beyond the ordinary, that yearning for other. The awareness of sin in ourselves is an awareness. Uh, despite the earn, yearning, there is an inability on our part to reach that, to achieve that, to manufacture that. And so Lovelace has these two uh, are, are the preconditions for uh, spiritual renewal, holiness, a knowledgement of sin. These are concepts that are way out of fashion in the modern world. I, you know, we hesitate even to use them, right? Martin Luther King Jr. said, we have in the modern age replaced a God-centered universe with a, quote, man-centered universe. And Dr. King writes, the means by which we live have outdistanced the ends for which we live. Our scientific power has outrun our spiritual power. We have guided missiles and misguided men. See, but in the wilderness, the myth of self-sufficiency begins to shatter. See, the wilderness will laugh at our golden calves the, the wilderness will strip away our pretenses, will expose our false hopes. I mean, there's only so much you can do to try to mask the pain in the wilderness. There's only so much Netflix you can actually watch, right? So much food to eat or exercise to do or uh, fancy adult juice to drink. <laughs> and there's nothing that will restructure your identity or your set of priorities than a, a journey in the wilderness, than a, than a divorce, than a, than a critical illness. Sometimes even than success itself, when you finally achieve that goal and you realize, oh my gosh, there's actually no pot of gold at the other end of the rainbow. And it's all been stripped away in the wilderness. And that's hard, but it can be so good. In a time of success, the Lord says to Israel through the prophet Jeremiah, listen to this. Has a nation changed its gods, even though they are no gods? But my people have changed their glory 
for something that does not profit. My people have committed two evils. They've forsaken me, the fountain of living water, and dug out cisterns for themselves, cracked cisterns that can hold no water. I know for me the fear uh, in the prayer, show me your glory, is that, well, if, if I were to really live for God's glory, if I were really to put God in his glory first in my life, then it would somehow diminish me. I'd rather live for myself, right? But the opposite is the truth. As the first question in the Westminster Catechism reminds us, the chief end of a human being is to glorify God and to enjoy God forever. Augustus said, our hearts are restless until they find their rest in thee. You see, the, the fact is, putting God's glory first in our lives, glorifying God, does not diminish us, just the opposite. It's when we seek God's glory that we are fully restored to the dignity and glory of our own humanity. The word glory in the Old Testament means honor. And it was first used, that, that Hebrew word, first used for, for weight. To have a lot of honor is to have a lot of weight, to have a lot of substance, uh, to be substantial, immovable, solid, enduring. And this, is, and this is what Moses is crying out for. Would you show me what really matters? Would you show me in life? Would you show me in the world? Would you show me in yourself? The substance, what's solid, what's immovable. Will you show me yourself, your essence? Show me your glory, I pray. It's a prayer that we pray in the wilderness. And it's a prayer for our spiritual renewal. And I want to just add, it's a prayer. God is eager to answer, but it is an active process. There is a dynamic conversation going on here between Moses and the Lord. And I want to just give you a little bit of, like, be a fly on the wall and hear this conversation as it runs throughout much of the Bible. Just listen. I'm going to just read some verses from the Bible so you can hear this. Psalm 85, verse 6. Revive us again so that your people may rejoice in you. Psalm 19, revive me according to your word. Isaiah 40, those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength, mount up with wings like eagles. Isaiah 57, for thus says the high and lofty one, I revive the spirit of the humble. That's a great verse. Zephaniah 3.17, even gets better. The Lord your God will renew you in his love. He will exalt over you with loud singing. Ezekiel 36, a new heart I will give you and a new spirit I will put within you and I will remove from your body the heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And then 2 Corinthians 4, Apostle Paul, so we do not lose heart. Even though our outer nature is wasting away, our inner nature is being renewed day by day. Colossians 3, having clothed yourself with a new self, Paul writes, which is being renewed in knowledge according to the image of its creator. And then finally, Paul references the passage that we're studying just today. Remember, when Moses comes off the mountain, his face is so radiant, it's reflecting the glory of God. He put a veil on it so he wouldn't hurt people with the brightness of it. Paul writes now, all of us in the new covenant with unveiled faces, seeing the glory of the Lord as though reflected in a mirror, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another for this comes from the Lord, the Spirit. So what I want to say to you today is if you're in the wilderness in this moment, it might just be that the Lord has put you there for one reason and that's so that you can engage with him, so that you can find Jesus. <laughs> that's the purpose of the wilderness so that you can pray this prayer that we see Moses pray for spiritual renewal. Lord, we lift up our hearts to you. Lord, show us your glory, we pray. That's, that's Moses. And the, the cry of the soul. Secondly, let's move to the response because we also want to seek the shelter of grace. And this is God's response. The shelter of grace is what he offers us. He says, I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious. This is God's decision about you. This is God's decision about those who pray this prayer and seek his glory. He says, I have shelter. 
I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious. Do you notice a slight note of scandal there? It's kind of like, I'll be gracious to whom I'll be gracious. Like he, and the reason he says that is because the average person looking on to this, especially the religious person, is going to go, well, not the Israelites then. <laughs> and, and, but he is talking about the Israelites. That's the amazing thing here. He's going to be gracious uh, to the Israelites. He's going he's to provide the shelter of grace with his hand for the Israelites. And then you go, well, that, it's, what about, that was Moses. No, but it's not just Moses. Moses is in this conversation with the Lord because he, he's there as a negotiator. He, he's negotiating on behalf of Israel. He's their representative. He's representing the people who at this very moment are the, at the foot of Mount uh, Sinai stewing in sin and rebellion and it's chaotic and nasty. It's spiritual wilderness. But the Lord is saying, I'm going to be gracious on them. They're going to get my presence. I'm compelled by my nature. I'm going to honor sinners. And he goes, so yeah, that is surprising. And this is what grace is. I said that we want to learn a little bit more about grace in this series. It's so important. If we're going to grow in grace, we have to know what it is. So let me share with you a definition and then two insights from this shelter in the rock. First, a definition of grace. Grace is a place for the undeserving in the honor of God. Grace is a place for the undeserving in the honor of God. That's grace. Now, two insights, and they come from two images here in this story. The first image is a hand, and the other is a book. The first insight comes from a hand, and it's this. Grace renews the substance of God's glory in us. In us. We see this in the hand. I will put you in a cleft of the rock, the Lord says to Moses, and I will cover you with my hand. I'm going to protect you behind my hand. But you've got to know, as the Lord's glory passes by, if you remember, it's thunder and lightning and wind and collateral things blowing. This is an F5 hurricane, tornado passing by behind the hand. So, I mean, you're not going to remain unchanged by this experience. Something's going to happen inside of Moses as a result of this place in the rock and the hand over him. Richard Lovelace uh, says, in fact, that renewal begins with an experience of grace and that there's no experience of renewal, no matter how hard we work on our spirituality, apart from God's grace. We have to know we are absolutely secure before the process can even begin. Lovelace, who's this, this expert on renewal, he says, yeah, gr uh, grace, the security of grace is required. Otherwise, we will be what he calls radically insecure persons. We might not even know it. These are his words. He says, unless we are sure that God loves and accepts us in Jesus, apart from our spiritual achievements, we are radically insecure persons. And this insecurity shows itself in pride, a fierce defensive assertion of our own righteousness, a, 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 def a defensive criticism of others. Such people come to naturally hate other cultural styles and other races in order to bolster their own security and discharge their suppressed anger. They cling desperately to legal, pharisaical righteousness. By the way, this is written in 1979. But envy, jealousy, and other branches of the tree of sin grow out of their fundamental insecurity. See, grace is, a, is security. And, and, and gra what he's saying is that grace is the primary precondition for spiritual renewal. Without that hand, anything that's not bolted down in Moses is going to just evaporate as God passes by. And the same is true for us. And here's what I want you to get. If you are going to ever come into God's presence, truly come into God's presence, not just the God of your own creation, but the actual God, if you're going to come into this God's presence, it's going to be scary. Something inside of you is going to get threatened. And you need to know that you're absolutely secure in God's grace for that to happen. Because there is no renewal without introspection, self-awareness, a probing for sin, actually a confessing of sin and a denunciation of sin. That's what's required for spiritual transformation and renewal. And it won't happen for people who are feeling insecure. You wouldn't dare. You couldn't dare. 
we have to be sure, as Lovelace writes, that God loves and accepts us in Jesus apart from our spiritual achievements. Or as the patron saint of UPC once said in the New York Times, Fred Rogers, the only way people change is in relation to someone who loves them. Right? Yeah, that's true. This is about the shelter of God's hand. Grace renews the substance of God's glory in us. That's the first insight. And the second is in the book. And it's this. Grace secures us in the honor of God's glory. God's glory in us first hand, but now us in God's glory book. God's grace secures us in the honor of God's glory. Now, here's where the book comes up. Exodus 32, 32. You can look at it. Here's what, here's what uh, Moses says as he's praying to the Lord. But now, if only you will forgive their sin, the whole calf incident, forgive their sin. But not, he says, catch this, blot me out of the book that you have written. Blot me out of the book that you have written. Apparently, ancient people had this notion that somewhere, probably up in the heavens, there was a book of life, you know, kind of a ledger uh, or a record of everybody who has life, uh, a book of honor. And, and we see this uh, cultural tradition reflected in the scriptures themselves. For example, in Psalm 69, verse 28, we read, let them be blotted out of the book of the living. Let them be blotted out of the book of the living. Let them not be enrolled among the righteous. Jesus himself, when he's trying to encourage his disciples, he says, rejoice that your names are written in heaven. That's Luke 10. It's hard for us to understand this. I think the closest thing I can think of to this would be like a reservation book at a restaurant. Have you ever gone to one of these really fancy restaurants and you, know, you walk in the door and there's a podium there and there's this big book there? And some restaurants are really hard to get into. You gotta like be somebody or know somebody who knows somebody to get in there. It's so packed at the door, you just elbow your way through and you know you don't stand a chance, right? You come up to the podium and there's the host. And she kind of smiles at you with a smirk like, who do you think you are? And you go, uh, I uh, was hoping to have dinner here. You know, there are three of us. And she looks at you with a scowl, you know, like it's over the, what do you call the bifocals or whatever, looking at you like this, you know. And then, and then she looks at the book or the, you know, it's the iPad these days, right? And just kind of looks down this list of names. And all of a sudden, there, sure enough, there's your name. It's in the book. And her whole face changes. Now the scowl turns this lovely smile. Oh, yes, Mr. Hinman, we've been waiting for you. We expect, so nice of you to come. Thank you for being with us, right? And they just lead you right through the crowd to a table and there's a feast. It's a reservation book. So what is Moses saying here? Well, just Here's the story again. He says to Israel, you have sinned, a great sin, but now I will go up to the Lord, negotiating, representative, perhaps I can make atonement for your sin. That's verse 30. And then in verse 32, then he says to the Lord, but now if you will only forgive their sin, but if not, blot me out of the book that you've written. What's he saying? Lord, take me out of the book. Take me out of the book, erase my name out of the book, and write their name in the book. These sinners, write their names in your book. This is a remarkable prayer. This is the Old Testament. This is Moses saying this. Take me so that they can live, so that they can enjoy your presence. Now, the Lord says, Moses, you've got a sin problem just like they do, so it's not going to work. But it points us forward. Here, Moses, the great Old Testament prophet, prophet's pointing us forward to Jesus. Jesus is here. This text speaks to us of Jesus. Because Jesus is the one who, who blots out his name to write our name in the book. This is what the cross is, hap is happening. He's, he's exposed. He voluntarily exposes himself to the unmitigated glory of a God who has absolute goodness on our behalf. He never sinned, but he did that for us. He, he's the one uh, who is the answer to Moses' prayer. He blots his name out of the book so that anybody who looks at that cross and believes on Jesus Christ, believes in his name, their names are in the book. The book of life. The book of honor. 
The shelter of grace creates a place where you are honored at the right hand of God the Father because of our Savior, Jesus Christ. I mean, this is the gospel. This is the story we come to celebrate today. A lot of people think that grace is like a second chance to make a different decision. Like, you, you ever wish you could go back and make a different decision about that date or whatever, you know, that, that drink or what? I wish I could make a difference. That's not grace. It might not be a bad thing if you could do it, but it's not as good as grace. Grace is not the ability to make a second decision. I mean, I know I'd make the same decision over and over again. Another bad decision about God, about myself, about other people. Grace is God's decision. It's the decision that God has made. It's a surprising, shocking, scandalous, unconditional decision about me, about you, about all sinners. It's about him making a place in his honor for us in his presence. So, friends, you, you know, your name is there. It's in the book. Jesus has secured a place of honor for you in his presence right now. You, as is, the way you are. You don't need a promise to change right now. Your name is in the book. That's grace. And so come to the host. Gosh, the host looks a lot like Jesus. Right? I mean, elbow your way in if you need to. Not because you're somebody. Don't bring your pedigree. Don't bring your resume. Bring your reservation. The reservation that Jesus has made for you. Come like the Israelites. Come like Miriam and Aram. Come like Joshua and Rahab. Come like the woman caught in adultery and Peter who denied Jesus. Elbow your way through if you need to. And when the house looks at you and says, so who are you? Tell them your name. And then you can say, you know, I really have no idea how all this happened and what I'm doing at a place like this. But if you'll look in your book, a man named Moses told me, you'll find my name there. Your name is there. By the way, this is how we become a Christian. It's, it's just an act of faith just to say, you know, I'm going to let Jesus blot out his name for me and write in my name where his should rightly go. That's what it means to be a Christian. We hear this good news, we believe it, and we say yes to Jesus. I want to invite you to do that. If you hadn't done that, if you hadn't received this gift, today is the day to do it. Come down and talk to our prayer team after the service. They would love to pray with you and just begin this wonderful journey, an adventure with Jesus. Uh, you can also click the button in the chat or you can come to upc.org slash Jesus. And by the way, I need to tell you, the reason we're keep, we continue to repeat this is because it's actually happening. People are coming to know the Lord here in our midst as a part of our ministry and it's stunning. It's so, so if you haven't experienced that yet, we want to invite you into that. But this is the shelter of God's book. Grace secures us in the honor of God's glory. Again, the definition, grace is a place for the undeserving in the honor of God. I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious. So we lift up our hearts to the Lord. You want to do that again? Just your, your hands just to remind yourself this week where you are. I li we lift up our hearts to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Do you know that Martin Luther King Jr. had a, an experience of spiritual renewal? He writes about it. A lot of people don't know this. He was in the wilderness, as I said. And one night he was in his kitchen. He'd been woken up, another threat on his life as he slept beside his wife. And he walked into the kitchen and he sat down and he just put his hands in his head and he was just ready to give up. He was a little overwhelmed by the Montgomery bus boycott and the increasing barrage of death threats on him and his family. And he was just broken, exhausted, and ready to give up on Montgomery, to give up on the dream. And then he turned to the Lord. He turned to the Lord and prayed. Here's what he writes in his own words. He says, at that moment, I experienced the presence of the divine the presence of the divine as I had never experienced him. Almost at once, my fears began to pass from me. And actually, th three days later, his house was bombed. His house was bombed. Now, they escaped, but uh, fortunately, but here's what he wanted us to know. He remained calm. He was already on the other side 
of the stress, on the other side of the anxiety, on the other side of the fear, on the other side of the exhaustion, on the other side of the brokenness. And then he turns around and gives us a charge. Listen to what he says as as he reflects on this episode. He says, let this affirmation be our ringing cry. It will give us courage to face the uncertainties of the future. When our days become dreary, with low hovering clouds and our night become darker than a thousand midnights, let us remember that there is a great benign power in the universe whose name is God and he is able to make a way out of no way and transform dark yesterdays into bright tomorrows. That's the wilderness, by the way. He makes a way out of no way. This is our hope he says, for becoming better people. And this is our mandate, he says, for, make, for seeking to make a better world. Would you pray with me? All right, Lord Jesus, uh, with Moses, we bow our hearts, our heads, perhaps we even kneel before you now with a sense of desperation. We are aware, uh, aware that there is no spark in our lives. All we bring is hay and kindling, and it's dry as dry can be. But we know that you can bring the fire. You've done it before, and we we pray now that you will give us the gift of Pentecost. Let your Holy Spirit blow through this room, blow through our lives, blow through your church as we worship around the world. Lord, show us your glory, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.